I'm gonna go ahead and get started because I might end a little bit a little sooner than normal because I want that there's a uh, a conference starting it starts at seven o'clock I'm not gonna stop at seven o'clock of course but there's a conference starting that I want to online that I want to participate in and 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 uh and see so I might stop right at 7 30 don't know we'll see all right well we're going to go ahead and pray bow our heads and pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all you've given us and blessed us with. We give you the glory and the honor. Know that you are a good God and there's none like you. And so as we study this word, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. We thank you that he will give us revelation, understanding, wisdom, knowledge as we study this subject of the fear of the Lord and cause it, Heavenly Father, to found, find good ground in our hearts. I pray for anyone who might still be getting linked on and coming on with us and get this to many ears as possible, Lord. You know who needs to hear it. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Someone just came on. Uh, last phone number numbers is 1501. I seem like I recognize that number, but I don't know who it belongs to. <laughs> Who's that? Pat Brooks. Pat Brooks. Oh, how you doing? Yes, how you doing, Sister Pat? Good, how are you all? Okay, you would think I would remember that number, but I, I, I don't remember the number, but I, it looked familiar. I said, I okay. someone I know. I just don't know who. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All okay. right, well, we're gonna, okay. get, we're gonna get started into session four. And uh, again, if you haven't seen the, or, or watched the other sessions, I mean, you weren't in on the other sessions, they are. Uh, loaded up on my uh, ministry page, Robin Wade Ministries. Just click the uh, video tab video and you'll see them and you can uh, listen to them and, and come up uh, on it. Oh, I guess I probably better hook up this so it doesn't go out of power. I didn't think about that just now until I saw the really not hooked up. Let me hook up my power right quick. Hmm. Yes. There we go. All right. So it doesn't go out on me in the midst of teaching. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me go to share and I'll go. I'll take my picture out so it won't be as much bandwidth. There we go. And share screen. There we go. And there we go. All right, we'll get started here. And I, I'll, there are a few things I, I'll always uh, review on this because I think they're they're that important. First of all, knowing that this this session, the fear of the Lord, is coming out of a book written by Ms. John Bevere, the fear of the Lord. The two books are there. One is the older or newer version of the other. Either one. They're they're almost exactly alike, alike, except what's in the very back. He has more videos and tapes and discs that you can use to go along with it. So short of that, everything else is exactly alike. Also, we'll be using as support on this a video, I mean, a YouTube teaching, a series of, of 10 videos by uh, Derek Prince, an outstanding Bible teacher. He's no longer with us. He passed away in 2004. But if you can get any book, any video, any tape by him, I'm telling you, you'll be blessed. He is uh, an anointed teacher uh, of the Bible. And I, right below that is the uh, link to that video series, by the way. All right, just a quick review, and I'll always review these things for sure. We, what we have studied so far at, by studying the fear of the Lord is that the essence of the fear of the Lord is the, the first commandment. And what's the first commandment? Thou shall have no other gods before me, found in Exodus 20 and 3. So it, it, the fear of the Lord means we put nothing before the Lord. It is the foundation of everything we do. It's the foundation of, of our relationship with him. And we have to make sure we don't mix up the spirit of fear with the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord is not about terror. It's about 
the foundational center of our relationship with God. There are different forms of fear that come from the spirit of fear. And we talked about that in, in uh, several sessions earlier. But one thing you know, when you want to try to find out the difference, the, 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 anything from the spirit of fear usually keeps us from God or keeps us from obeying God. It puts us in bondage and it's enslaving. When, it's, when you are in those characteristics and you know you're not talking about the fear of the Lord, you're talking about the spirit of fear. And as Timothy said, we are, we're, we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. The fear of the Lord motivates us to obey God. It moves us closer to, to God, as a matter of fact, the, when you're operating in the fear of the Lord. You got to ask yourself, is this fear that you're facing, this thing that's, that's pressing on you, is it motivating you to dis disobey God or to obey God, even at the price of suffering? A person who is walking in the, in the fear of the Lord says, Lord, let me not put anything of my choice before yours. Let not anything seem more important to me than your will. That's the fear of the Lord. Okay. All right. We looked at some, uh, now the last time we met, we looked at some biblical church uh, examples of the church walking in the fear of the fear of the Lord, but back in the early church. And, and one thing Derek Prince mentioned, he said that, um, you know, a lot of people say that, hey, we got a good church, we're large, we don't have to worry about the fear of the Lord, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal, and look how big we are, look how fast we've multiplied, but he says a lot of times it's almost like a mushroom. Churches that operate, that don't operate in the fear of the Lord tend to wither quickly because they have no root. We looked at the example of the uh, fear of the Lord where Ananias and Sapphira uh, came and, and, and lied and passed away. And the Bible says great fear came upon them. And, and we, we had to think, what kind of fear are we talking about? Were people like terrified? I mean, after all, uh, Ananias and Sapphira fell down dead immediately. Or was this the fear of the Lord? Well, it actually is a little, it's a kind of a mix, you know, a lot of times people say the fear of the Lord is not terror. Well, that is true. But it, 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 it's, it is a, a, a knowing. It is a, a, a wisdom. of it's, it's the same type of fear that you don't run up and grab a, a live wire. <laughs> okay? And, you, and, and you're not afraid of the live wire because you know what it's about. So you don't do that. You don't have to be terrified of the wire. You know to keep away from it. Well, it's that it's kind of like that. The fear of the Lord means you you walk in the will of the Lord. You knew you know the things that God has told you to do. You put those first, and you honor Him. You worship Him. We're going to look at that in, in a second. The the New Testament tells us you we can't even walk properly submitted to one another without the fear of the Lord. It's an integral part of relationships. The fear of the Lord. It should always be on our mind. Now, John Bevere, uh, one of the last things we talked about last time was one of the things that he told us that is that there's a pattern that uh, reveals itself constantly uh, in, in the Bible when it comes to the fear of the Lord. And it's, a, it's, a added, it's a pattern of divine order, God's glory, and then judgment. And so we looked at an example of one, starting with the book of Genesis, the creation of mankind. And we looked at the fact that from Genesis, the first chapter, all the way through to the second chapter, or actually halfway through the first chapter, God was putting things in order. He had created creation in the first uh, part, first phase of verse one, and then suddenly it was without form or void. Something happened, something to knock it out of order, to put it in chaos, put it in complete disorder. And so starting with verse three, God starts putting things back into divine order by speaking it. He says, let there be light, and there was light. And then he said, let there be this, let, and, and things, he started putting things back in order, and he did it for six days. He put things back to, in order. And this is what we talked about last time. Now, let's continue. He continues to put things in order all the way up until the last creation, the last thing he's going to create. 
And when order had been established, when the garden had been established, when all plant life, animal life, water, sun, moon, stars, all atmosphere had all been established. And remember John de Bevere's um, uh, order. He says, first there is uh, divine uh, order, then there's glory. Well, then came glory. And you say, well, where's the glory? Uh, sorry, folks, something happened here with my Facebook uh, thing. Uh, let me get that back in order here. Okay, there we go. I'm not sure why it went out. But anyway, probably because of weak signal is a real windy here. Anyway, so when everything is back in order, now comes the glory because after divine order comes glory. Where is this order? Or where is this glory? The glory comes with man. Now, how does the how how does that work work? Where is that glory coming with man? Well, simple. Man wasn't created with fur or an outer covering. Because as the psalmist says in Psalms 8 and verse, verse 5, God crowned him with glory and honor. That glory came with his creation of man. And not only did he create his body, but he shrouded him in glory. His own glory. God gave took his own glory and shrouded man in this. And, and you'll remember at the end of verse 2, it says that they were naked. Adam and Eve were naked. And they were unashamed. Why? It's because they were covered by the glory of God. They didn't need fur. They didn't need clothes. They didn't need out for covering because their covering was glory. So first was order, then was glory. And I looked at that Hebrew word and, and it came from one of the things that John uh, Bevere said. The word crowned, uh, he was crowned in glory, means is at, at atar. It means to encircle or surround. So they were crowned, they were encircled, they were surrounded by the glory of God. So there was the glory. We've had the divine order, now we have the glory. And, as, and glory continues, the glory phrase, phase of order, uh, of, of, of the pattern of the fear of the Lord continues as long as the fear of the Lord continues. And what is the fear of the Lord? It's reverence, it's worship, it's obedience. It's honor, it's putting him first priority in first place. And as long as that continues, the glory continues. But when there is no fear of the Lord, when reverence falls, when worship falls, order and obedience falls, when God no longer is the priority and other things are put before him, then judgment follows. Remember, uh, John Bevere says, Order, divine order, glory, and judgment. And that's exactly what happened. Adam, knowing full well what God had told him, and Eve, knowing full well what she had been told, chose to disobey God. And this was a this is a, this was high treason. It wasn't just irrelevance, irreverence. Sorry, it was high treason. And judgment followed immediately. God had told them if they ate of this tree, the tree of knowledge of, of uh, good and evil, that they would surely die. And judgment followed. They did die. Spiritually, they died. Spiritually, their relationship with God was severed. Spiritually, they were in death and darkness. And was severe. And, and ultimately, they ended up having to be, they ended up being kicked out of the garden and they brought into the world death, darkness, sin disease, and every dark thing. That's judgment. Now, I want to look at this statement that, that John Veer had in his book. He said, if God reveals his glory and the people return to a lack of fear, there is certain judgment. Judgment will come. Now, here's the real the problem, probably the thing to keep in mind. The greater the glory the greater and swifter the judgment. As we, as we saw with Adam and Eve, it happened immediately. They ate up the fruit and immediately, the Bible said, the eyes changed. Immediately, the glory dispersed. Immediately, they were separated by sin from God. Let's take a look at another example of the pattern 
uh, of the fear of the Lord, of, of divine order, of glory, and then judgment. And, and Anadab and Abahu, I can't even pronounce those. I should have looked it up and, and got a pronunciation, but you see them there. If you turn in your Bible to Leviticus, these two men were sons of Aaron. Now, who is Aaron? Aaron, first of all, was Moses' brother. He was the spokesman for Moses when he was dealing with, with uh, Pharaoh, if you remember. But Aaron also was the first high priest. When God gave Moses uh, the pattern of, of developing the tabernacle, he also gave him the pattern of what the priesthood should be like and who should be in the, pri in the priesthood. And he, he decreed that the priesthood would always come from the tribe of Levi. And the very first priest was Aaron. And so the priesthood would remain in Aaron's family forever that that was the the commandment so Aaron's sons those two there were Aaron's Aaron actually had four sons and these two were priests under Aaron now first of all there's divine order the priesthood is established Moses is given the template he's given the plan He's shown how to train them and get them ready to be priests. He's shown how to dress them, what their uniform should look like, what their robe should be, uh, look like, what their duties would be. The, the tabernacle, he was given the pattern of the tabernacle, what it should look like, how it should be raised, where the tribe should be arrayed around the tabernacle, and the rules of order are all pub published. This is the order phrase, it's set in order. And if you read back further, uh, where, where actually in Exodus, when the temple was raised and set and ready, when it was ready, God himself, his very presence filled the tabernacle, his glory, his presence, and he dwelt among the people. That was his plan. That was what he desired to dwell, dwell among his people. So when order was set, then the glory of God, the presence of God comes and fills the tabernacle. First divine order, then glory. But let, don't forget that statement I have at the beginning of this slide. It says, when people return to the lack of fear, then there is certain judgment. And the greater the glory, the swifter and, and greater the judgment. You can't get greater glory than the very presence of God himself. God himself, his glory filled the temple. That was God. And it was very important that Aaron and his sons follow the rules exactly because they would be in close proximity with the full glory of God. But that didn't happen. These two sons, these sons of Aaron, appointed priests who should have known better and they did know better. They were trained and taught and had been serving. This, is, this wasn't their first rodeo. They knew exactly how to serve and they had been serving. But for whatever reason, some theologians believe that they got drunk, but there's, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us what happened. Nothing tells us why they did this. But for whatever reason, they went and got their censers, censers that burn incense, filled them up, and approached the holy place. Why? We don't know. But when they did that, it was considered disrespectful. It was complete violation of protocol. You don't go stepping up to the presence of the Lord without order and out of order. And that's what they did. They stepped up to the very presence of God in the holy place, not the holy of holies, in the holy place, to, and presented this incense near the near the holy place it was profane in other words it, it, the bible new testament says it was profane offer showing disrespect or contempt for sacred things ill irreverent and immediately judgment was immediate and severe the bible says that the fire came from the lord and they were burned to ashes and I misspelled, it's not mourning, it's mourning as in sadness, that, that's the wrong mourning. And no one was allowed to, to mourn for them, not even Aaron, their father and their brothers. 
God told them, don't even, basically, I'm paraphrasing, don't even drop a tear for these two. This is what he said. And they, they gathered up their robes because that was all that was left of them. They gather, gathered up the ashes and the robes and took these two remains of ashes and buried them outside the camp. Why so severe? Why so immediate? Well, just as we said, the greater the glory, the greater, more severe and swifter the judgment. Because sin cannot stand in the presence of God. In the very first place, if you remember in the Old Testament, whenever God showed himself, he enshrouded himself in clouds and smoke. Well, that wasn't because God had any particular affinity to smoke or clouds, but it was to protect us and was to protect the people because they would not have been able to survive in the presence of his glory unfiltered. So he covered himself in thick cloud and thick smoke to protect them. And you go up there out of order, doing whatever you wanted to do in any way and walk right up into the glory of God, and it's not going to go well. And it didn't go well for his, for Adam, uh, uh, Aaron's two sons. Any comments or questions so far? Okay, we'll keep going. Well, that's not the only the, the, the only situation where we see this this order. Eli and his sons. Now this. You you might you had another high priest. Eli is the high priest now. This is several uh, centuries later down the line. Eli is a Levite. His sons are, are are he's the high priest, and his sons are priests under him. You'll find this story in First Samuel. Where's the order? Well, the priesthood is well established. It was established all the way back in Aaron's time, and it's still working. In order, the rules still the same. The tabernacle is still standing as it should be. Operations are as they as God set them and appointed them. And Eli and his sons were appointed rightfully. They were legitimate high priests. They weren't out of order being priests. They had been appointed and elected by God. We'll read that here in a few minutes to be the 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 head of the priest. The law is well known and they're in operation. The presence of the Lord continues to be with the people, but something else is happening. Something else has happened. So let's, let's go to 1 Samuel. Chapter 2. This is where Samuel actually, Samuel was introduced uh, back in chapter one when his mother prayed for a son and, and promised God that if, if uh, he would give her a son, she would loan him, she would return him to God. And she did this by, by uh, bringing him to Eli that he might become uh, and be uh, given to the service of God in the in the uh, tabernacle. Now, I said that the glory, uh, the order is an order, and there is glory, but something has happened. Something has happened, and so start with uh, verse uh, chapter two, uh, verse twelve. Okay, and. Well, actually, uh, chapter three, I might scoot, scoot over chapter two. Chapter three, verse two. And it says, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark was, Samuel was laid down to sleep. Okay, so we see that first of all, Eli is old, and he can't see his 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 vision is dumb down. But at verse one of chapter three, it also says, "The word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision." Now, what does that mean? 
that means that when it says the precious Lord, uh, the word of the Lord was precious, it's not talking merely about the value. It's talking about the lack of it, the rarity of it. And it's that there was no open vision. If there's no open vision, that means God is not speaking. So during Eli's time, during his priesthood, things had gotten to a point where the word was not, was not powerful at all. And God had stopped speaking. And God doesn't stop speaking unless something is up. There's something wrong here. And first of all, we see that Eli is said, wax dim. That means he's getting weak. And he could not see. And it's not just talking about physical could not see, though it, it doesn't mean he was blind, but it also means spiritually he, can, he can't see. Now, that's, you're in a bad shape when the high priest is spiritually blind. Why is that? What else is going on? Is it just an Eli thing? No. Now go to chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Beal. Beal. They knew not the Lord. Stop. Wait a minute. You talking to me that the, the priesthood, the two priests under Eli, the high priest, his own sons, didn't know the Lord and they were evil. Beal is a, is a God, is a, is a fallen, uh, evil God, an evil idol. And it says they were sons of this evil. In other words, they worshiped, they act, they reflected him. And most importantly, it says they knew not God. Let me can continue verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came. While the flesh was in the seething, while it was being prepared and, and, and cooked, while a with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hands, that he stuck it in the pan or a kettle or a cauldron or a pot, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh all unto all the Israelites that came hither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed. Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have a sodden flesh for thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, let him not fail to burn the fat presently, then take as much as thy soul desire. Then he would answer them, nah, but you give it to me now. And if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Now, let me tell you what all that let me break that down if you remember well maybe that was another class well if you remember the the tribe of levi didn't get an inheritance of land their inheritance was the priesthood and what made this so significant and so uh, such a blessing is that the priest handled all the sacrifices which means all the animal sacrifices, flower sacrifices, oil sacrifices, money sacrifices. They they handled all the offerings, all everything that came and and the life of the entire nation centered around the temple, or around the tabernacle later, the temple. Everything. Everyone came to the temple. Everyone brought things to the temple. Everyone brought sacrifices for different reasons to the temple. And so when you think about how many people were in the nation and the nation was just doing nothing but growing and they're bringing animals for sacrifice, they would bring these animals in, they would give them uh, to the priest, the priest would do the things they needed to do, pray over it, whatever, and they would make the sacrifice, but to see the priest, depending on the offering, didn't have to sacrifice the entire thing. They only sacrifice certain parts of it, and we'd have to get into the study of the temple and sacrifices to to know what was sacrificed when. But what was left was given to the priest and they, and only they, only the priesthood, only those who were in the priesthood could eat it. And there was, and, and, and you got to remember, what was bringing brought was the best of the best, the best of the lambs, the best of the bullocks, the best of the flour, the best of the oil, the most of the money, all these things, the best of the best was being brought to the temple. And the priest had access to anything that did, was not supposed to be sacrificed. What it was sacrificed, they sacrificed it. And what was left was what was there 
them to live on and they had plenty. This, this is why it was such a blessing. But what had happened here, what we see here is these two priests of Eli's decided they're going to do whatever they wanted to do. And instead of waiting for the sacrifice to be properly set up and properly sacrificed and then getting what was left as it was supposed to for their tables and for feeding, they wanted what they wanted now. They wanted to choose what they get. They wanted to decide what it was and what condition it was and, and, and all that. And so basically they were spinning on God. They were just saying, well, no, the priority is not God. The prior priority is what we want even though we know what the order should be. So you know, so you, you understand how evil it was, but it didn't stop there. Look at chapter two, verse 22. Now, Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Uh, I guess it always comes down to that, doesn't it? So not only were they violating the sacrifice and the offerings, but they were violating the women. Women would come to the temple to offer sacrifices, to pray, to ask for prayers and, and needs from the, the, the priests, and the priests would be sleeping with these women, whoever they chose. And Eli, here, and here's the key, Eli knew about it. He knew about it. So you would say, well, he's, he's going to stop it, right? He's the high priest. He's responsible for all this. Well, let's hear what he says. Verse 23. And he said unto them, why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this, by all the people. In other words, everybody's telling me, why are you doing this? He's, he's, saying, he's asking them. And he says, nay, my sons, for it is not good. This is not a good report I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? He's telling him, he's warning him. He says, it's one thing to sin against people, but when you sin against the Lord, you, that's the end of the rope. And their response, it says, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord, because the Lord would slay them. And so they didn't listen to him. And so you would think, well, surely Eli was not going to stand for that. Not only was it just dis disrespect to the Lord, they were, dis they were disrespecting him. They weren't paying him any mind, even though he was their father and, and the high priest. So surely he would stop them. He would kick them out. He would remove them, right? Well, that's not what happened. Because when God spoke to Samuel, who was a child at the time, about what he was going to do, and when not only did God talk to Samuel, but God talked to another man of God and sent him to Eli to tell him what he was going to do. And this is what God told Eli. He said, did I plainly appear to the house of thy father, Aaron? He said, and he's saying, did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? I'm skipping a little bit. He said, did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? And honorest thy sons above me? In other words, I gave you all these things and you're holding your son's needs and wants above me? Skip down to verse 30. Towards the end it says, for them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And let me skip on down. Says, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to, cons to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And he says, and that's not all, your two sons in one day, they shall both, they, they die, both of them. They shall die, both of them. So God tells him after a while of this going on, that here's the judgment. 
your whole family, when you were selected, your family was selected out of the tribe of, of Levi to be the priesthood. But since you refused to honor me, since you refused to fear me, since you put your, your sons above me, and oh, by the way, you're getting a little bit of this too, because it says here that even Eli ate of the offering that he knew they had taken wrongly. He said, because you did all that, he said, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to cut you off, your family off. Anyone who, who survives, their, their, their lives will be a living hell, basically is what he says. I'm cutting you off, and there will not be any uh, men serving in my priesthood when I do this. Now, you would think, okay, well, this is going to happen. This, you, here's the next chapter. This is going to happen. Well, we know that doesn't happen because this happened when Samuel was a child. When, when judgment finally happened, Samuel is 30 years old. So several decades pass before judgment falls. But when judgment falls, it falls. It says that Hophi and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, appointed priests who should have known better, and always demanded the best of the meat offering and committed fornication with the women. They refused to stop and change. And Eli refused to discipline him. And he partake it, partaken uh, of that, that offering that he should that was illegally taken. The sons, there, there came a time where there was a battle between the uh uh, uh, uh not Palestine. Uh, the word is Pal Philistines. There we go. Uh, between the Philistines, and this battle was a major battle. And what they went, what the sons did, they went in and got the Ark of the Covenant and took it because because that's how they they fought a lot of their battles. They would bring the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant at the time was not just a box. It possessed the presence of God, the glory of God. So they got this Ark of the Covenant and and brought it and led the army into this battle, both Phineas and Hophi. Well, they got into this battle and the Phil Philistines defeated them beat they lost almost half the army they took the ark of the covenant and both sons were killed and when eli who by this time the bible says he was heavy in other words he was very fat he was he was ill he was sick and he was blind uh someone that escaped the battle came to the city and told eli what happened and when he heard it because he he knew he was he knew this was not, not going to turn out well. And they'd taken the Ark of the Covenant. It, it seems the implication here was that he wasn't in agreement with them taking the uh, Ark of the Covenant. But they had. And when he found out that they had been killed and the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen, he was in such shock. He fell back in his chair and he was sitting close to the gate. And so when he fell back, he fell back in a position where all his weight fell upon, pressed against his neck, and he broke his neck, and he died. So the two sons died. Eli died. And that's not all. At the same time, uh, Phineas' wife was pregnant. And when she heard the news, the shock of the news sent her into labor. And the grandson was born, but, it, but she died. And just before she died, she named this son Ichabod. Now, you probably only heard of this word, this name once. <laughs> you know, Ichabod Crane, uh, Crane, the headless horseman. Well, Ichabod is a word, a Hebrew name and a Hebrew word that means no glory or the glory has departed. And that's all that you ever hear of Eli, of his sons or his household ever again. From that point on, Samuel becomes the head priest or yeah, the, the head priest in there. So judgment falls. But here's the question. Why did God treat Aaron's sons different than Eli's sons? Anybody have an idea of that? Karen or, or, or Pat, why did God treat Aaron's sons? Aaron's sons, they were, they were fried to a crisp immediately. But yeah. Eli's sons yeah. kept doing wrong for at least two to three decades. Before it I finally don't know. happened to them. 
I I don't know. I don't know why he didn't he didn't put him down right away. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's take a look at it. Because both sons were legitimate priests. They weren't, they weren't, you know, someone that just that decided to do something they wanted. No, they were lit, they were anointed and appointed by God. They both uh they both, uh, I don't know why, but saved the Lord. They both knew the Lord and knew the rules. They both did profane and disrespectful things that, that disrespected God. And highly, not just small things, we're talking about major things that disrespected God. They both clearly lacked the fear of the Lord. Well, here's some of the here's a clue. Here's some of the clues that John Bevere puts out that I think are, are very, I mean, they're right on the money. First of all, if you remember, remember what I read, it says the word of God was precious. In other words, it was rare. The word of God was was not being used. People were not not used to hearing the word. It got to a point where people didn't know the word of God. There was no widespread revelation of God because he wasn't speaking. The Bible says that there was no voice. There was no vision, no open vision from the Lord. He wasn't speaking to the high priest or to the priests. Eli himself was so darkened. He was blind, not only physically, but he was blind spiritually. And he was just as bad as his sons because he didn't correct them. And the Bible says the lamp of the God lamp of God was going out. In other words, his presence had gotten to a point where there was almost no presence at all. So in the case of Aaron's sons, it's completely different. In Aaron's sons, this, they're the first priest. Aaron is the first high priest. His two sons were the priests. And God is there in his full glory in the, in the Ark of the, of the Covenant. And when they did, that means his presence is strong. This, there, is no, there was no lack of vision. There was no uh, lack of revelation. There was no darkness. God was in his bright brightness. And so when they walked up to him, they, they were consumed immediately. Remember what I uh, pointed out to you in the other slide? The higher, the more intense the glory, the swifter and more severe the judgment. And that's the case with Aaron's sons. However, with Eli's sons, as we just said, it, uh, the word of God was rare. There was no widespread revelation. God's presence was so low that it was just, the Bible said his lamp was going out. His glory had faded to a trace. And so uh, not only were they not walking in and know God, God wasn't there in his fullness. In one way, that's a blessing. They had more opportunity, but in another way, it, if he's not there, they're not going to change, okay? The priesthood was shrouded in darkness, and that's why it, it was a little bit longer. Again, the greater the presence of glory, the swifter and more severe the punishment. The more you should know better, the higher, the more severe your punishment. That's another way of putting it. Well, why, why wasn't the glory of God there as much? For, uh, the, in Bible lifetime. Gives, well, the Bible, the Bible gives us three clues. He first he says the high priest himself was not walking in in the Lord. That that's the only explanation why he would be spiritually and physically blind. Okay, so there was a lack in Eli, and we know there's a lack in Eli because he did not only did he correct himself, he didn't correct his sons when he knew they were walking in, in, in sin, which brings the next thing. The priesthood, his two sons were walking in, in evident intense sin. They, they, were, uh, they were stealing from the, from the sacrifice, and they were sleeping with women. And they were putting themselves in head, ahead of God, and they were the priest, and they were leading the people to do the same thing. So that's why God's God's presence had stepped back, and had stepped back, and had stepped back. Now, did it all happen in Eli's time? I I don't know. I would imagine. Now, this is just me. I would imagine it was happening all along, and when it came down to Eli, it just happened even more down to the to the close to the end. 
but we don't know about the only priests we know for sure about is Aaron, Aaron's sons, Aaron's grandsons, and then the next time we hear about priests, we hear about Eli. And, and, and there's there and there's almost a century between before we hear about Eli. So over time, over time, God's presence was ebbing. And that's that's actually that's not that <laughs> that happens all the time. And that's what happened here. Did, did I answer your question, Karen? Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, I, I guess I. I mean, what exactly did they do? Who they walked in sin? That's the bottom line. If you're walking in sin over time, God is God is not going to continue to 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 be with you. He's not going to continue to bless you. He's not going to continue to cover you. He'll start backing off and backing off. And it's not that he's backing off. It's you walk away. And the further from him you walk away, the less of him, you less of his presence you'll have. And so, it got so, to a point during the year. Go ahead. So, so his, his glory leaving was because over time they were not doing what they were supposed to do. Correct. Correct. But then, the, the but, then, but then after a while they were continuing to do what they weren't supposed to do or maybe doing worse and then God decided to take them out yeah he, yeah he he gave them in other words he gave them every opportunity he'd already told them this is what's going to happen now here's you you bring up a good point Judgments are not always immediate. A lot of times, and we, we see this throughout the Bible, God announced a judgment. But if you turn, if you respond, if you repent, he'll hold back that judgment. Where have we seen that? How about Jonah and the city of Nineveh? Remember that story? Well, God told Jonah to tell the Ninevites, in 40 days, you are going to be destroyed. End of, the, end, end of the story, period. And when they heard that, when they heard uh, Jonah's preaching and what he told them, his, the prophecy, they immediately went into fasting. Everybody, the king came off his throne, put on sackcloth. He commanded everybody, even the animals, put on sackcloth. He, he commanded everyone to fast that maybe, maybe God might have mercy on them. And because he did that, the judgment that he had for Nineveh, he held back. And no, Jonah was mad. Well, here's the rest of the story. Several centuries later, Nineveh ended up in the same place. And they were end up being destroyed. Centuries later. But my point is that when God gives a judgment, it's not always immediate. And many times he will give people the opportunity to repent the turn and and Eli's sons had a time had an opportunity to repent to seek him out they had all the tools they needed to do just that to turn from their wicked they knew what they were doing was wicked they had opportunities to do that and he gave them that opportunity but the judgment was still there and it was going to happen because God had pronounced it if God pronounced it is going to happen he gives you an opportunity to repent but if you don't repent, it's going to happen. And that's exactly what happened. And that's an important point. I'm glad you asked, you, you mentioned that. That's an important point as we study the fear of the Lord. Because there's some things we're going to see in, in future sessions. That that point, that very point, uh, you got to know. You got to know. All right, let's take a look at more keys to the fear of the Lord. John Bevere, I, it was so urgent. He, I, I, I typed this word for word. This is what John Bevere says. He says, hear me, people of God. You can have the holy anointing oil on you, like Nadab and Abihu, that's Aaron's sons, did. 
You can operate in signs and wonders, cast out demons, heal the sick in his mighty name, and yet lack the fear of the Lord. And it is the fear of the Lord that causes you to stand before the presence of the Lord forever. And you say, well, how can that be? That's not Bible. Yes, it is. Jesus said, many of you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do what I, what I say. Many of you are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we heal? Didn't we recover? Didn't we raise from the dead? And notice his response is never going to be, no, you didn't do that. Because in fact, they did. But the bottom line is they didn't know him. And they were under judgment. The Lord allowed them to operate even in the giftings that he gives them until the last minute. They had an opportunity to the very last minute to repent. And they didn't. You can, you can, you can honestly and legitimately have been appointed, anointed to serve as pastor, appointed, anointed to serve as Sunday school teacher, appointed, anointed to serve as deacon. But if you don't walk in the fear of the Lord, you don't know him and you will face a judgment. It might be quick. It might be over time. It depends on your situation. We see two of them right there, Aaron's sons and Eli's sons. But judgment is the, is the third part of order. Remember, there's divine order, there's glory, and then there's judgment. Another, another statement that John Bevere wrote, he says, the greater God's glory, greater God's revealed glory, the greater and swifter the judgment of irreverence. Whenever sin enters the presence of God's glory, there is an immediate reaction. Sin and anyone who willfully bears it will be obliterated. The greater the intensity of light, the less chance darkness has to remain. And one last statement, don't mistake God's delay of judgment for the denial of it. We often say that about blessing. We often say when someone's waiting for a blessing that God's delay is not denial. Well, it's the same for judgment too. God's delay is not denial of judgment either. Okay. I think that's the last, yeah, that was the last one for, for today. Um, I told the people at the very beginning, I, I'm, I normally have a little bit more to go, but I, I'm, I'm going to be attending a, a, a great conference tonight. And I want to, want to get on that. So that's where we're done today. But for, for our next meeting, Read chapters six, seven, and eight of John Bevere's book. If you haven't gotten it yet, you've got plenty of time. And as I say, I continue to say, even if you never come to another session, get this book and read it. That's how important it is. And that's how important the subject of the fear of the Lord is. Because we're coming into a period where the glory of God is going to become greater and greater. There's a great awakening, a great revival that is sweeping this globe. And his presence, his glory is going to be brighter. And many people say, that's great. More glory, more presence of God. Well, it is, but there something comes with that. What comes with it is walking in the fear of the Lord because the closer you are to glory with sin on you, the more severe, swift, and immediate judgment is. We're going to be talking about some of that. I, I, I thought we were going to get into Ananias and Sapphira, but we're not, not going to get into it today. But read chapter 6, 7, and 8 of John Bevere's book and listen to part 6 and 10 of uh, Derek Prince's uh, YouTube uh, series. There, again, is the link. And I hope you are still searching your Bible, getting yourself a, a concordance or looking at Bible Gateway to look up all the references to fear of the Lord in the Bible. Okay. Our next session will be 14 April, the 14th of April. Okay. So with that, Pat, any comments or questions? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I just want, will you um, repeat the statement that you made about don't mistake God's uh, was it delayed judgment? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, don't mistake God's delayed judgment as denial of judgment. Denial, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. and John Revere, what's the name of the book? Is that it's called the fear of the, the fear of the Lord. This is a good. The lesson. fear. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Karen, anything? Um, no, no, nothing else. Okay, all right. Well, I hope that I hope that that in the teaching you're getting what the Holy Spirit would have. I think this is a apropos time because as I said, the glory of the God is, is growing, the awakening, the revival on this earth is growing and we have got to be ready for it. It's not all party and, and laughter if we're not in right position. And if we're walking in sin, particularly known sin, it can be dangerous. I believe that we're gonna start seeing more people drop in the middle of church It'll be just like the days of Ananias and Sapphira. They had the nerve. If they had walked in the fear of the Lord, they would not have done what they did. But we'll get to that. All right. Short of that, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've given us, what you're teaching us, how you're preparing us. Heavenly Father, let us take this in. Prepare us to walk in the fear of the Lord. Teach us to walk in the fear of the Lord. Cause us to, to walk in such a way that not only are we honoring you, not only are we reverent to you, but we our relation, relationship with you grows because we are walking in the fear of the Lord. We give you the glory for it. We give you the honor and we lift you up in esteem. I pray for all those who are listening right now and those who will listen later by watching the video and let the Holy Spirit reveal to them all that they need to know. We give you the glory, Heavenly Lord. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. Well, y'all have a good, good evening, a good weekend. Stay, stay safe. Get out. Keep out of the smoke. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And see you next time around. Thanks a bunch. I really enjoyed it. This was a great lesson. Praise God. All righty. All righty. And I. Well, oh, no wonder I. There we go. All right. And Facebook folks, same goes to you. And don't forget to go to the uh, uh, video part of, of my Facebook page. And if you haven't seen any of the past sessions, they're on there. I highly recommend them. With that, I'll see you later. And goodbye. Bye.